We've been talking about uh, the Ten Commandments. Woo! Y'all, it's, it's, been, it's been heavy on me to study uh, because I don't know about you, but everything I study, I, I got to deal with myself, you know, because you, what happens when you look at that law, you realize what you're not. Uh, and then I have the added pleasure to say, now I got to go preach this Lord <laughs> like I'm perfect. I, I mean, you guys know I'm not, but, but I have to go preach it in such a way that I can preach it without the heaviness of condemnation on my soul. So when I preach to you, I want you guys to know uh, that this is for us uh, because I believe with all my heart that as we look at the Ten Commandments, the goal of seeing Jesus for who he is will become the main goal. Not, not to beat us down, not to, not to show us where we lack. We all know we lack. Nobody in here is without question. Nobody walked in floating on a carpet, you know, like, like you're some kind of deity. You're not perfect. We all understand that we're imperfect people seeking a perfect God. And so as we look at the, the commandments, we ask ourselves, what should we see? The first, the first week we realized that God was a jealous God and a loving God. That he wants uh, our praise alone. He doesn't, he doesn't want us to, to uh, uh, demean what he can do and belittle him by choosing some other God. He's jealous for our love and our affection and our attention. And the second commandment he spoke to us, he, he wanted us to know too that you shouldn't bow before any other God, whatever it might be. Maybe it's a God of, of idle feelings or an, an idol of low commitment and convenience um, uh, or whatever those idols that we bow down to. He says, I don't, I don't want you to sell out. I want you to know who I am. I want you to know that I'm a faithful God and that I long to meet your need. That's why we pray. That's why we sing songs of worship that he is able to do. But this morning we are on that one, which I remember when I was a young kid. I, um, I used to curse really, really, really bad. So when I was young, we would, you know, because we were young, we were trying to establish our credibility and our respect amongst our peers and we would cuss all the time you know and I remember being 12 years old walking across the church parking lot and as soon as I hit that church parking lot I was whipped I was I wasn't gonna say a word not on holy ground I'm not no I'm not and I so we would not cuss none of us me and my friends we would not cuss or say anything bad while we were on church property but as the moment I stepped off that church property I went right back to being and uh, I don't think nobody does that anymore. But I know back in the day when we used to have a reverence, you know, I don't know if it was just the reverence of God or just the fear that if my mom heard me cussing on a church parking lot, I would have problems, you know, of the medical kind, you know. So I, <laughs> I, was, I was sure to not, to not take his name in vain. And so this morning we're looking at that. Turn with me to Exodus Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. It reads, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. There was a story, uh, not a story, but actually a, um, a practice that the priests uh, used to go through in writing the name of God down. Uh, they would write down his name. They wouldn't use all the letters to spell out his name. They would only use um, uh, the consonants of his name. And so, what they would do in writing his name out as they were writing in the Torah or reproducing it, they would, they would go and wash their hands first, first off. There was a ceremony called the, uh, I think it's the McVeigh. And so um, uh, they would go and wash their, wash their hands, wash their body. Then they'd put on a holy robe. They'd sit down and they'd write one letter of his name. Then they would get up. They would destroy their instrument. They would take off their outer robe and they would sanctify it, then they'd do it all over again for the next letter, and the next letter, and the next letter. In fact, if they even got it wrong, for some reason, I don't know how you get it wrong, you're writing one letter at a time, it's got to take you 10 minutes to write one letter. But if you got it wrong, they would scrap the whole section of the tour they were writing in. Now, I don't know about you, have y'all seen how hard it is to write with quill pen and ink? You know, like, like that backspace ain't real, you know what I mean? Like, you, you really got to start all over again. And so I'd be in control Z all day, but it would not work for me. And so I, when I see how, how, press, how precious to them and how prestigious his name was, that really challenged me 
Do I look at the name of God in such a way that if, if I write it down and I get it wrong or, or that, my, that I would destroy my pen or my computer, you know, for writing one letter of his name? I mean, that, that, that mindset really uh, tested me. In fact, let me just ask you a quick question, too. Let me see where your reverence is. When you spell the name of God, you make it with a capital G or a lowercase g? You better say capital. That's an easy one right there. But when you write the word him in reference to his name, is it a capital H or a lowercase h? <laughs> you know what bothers me is that everywhere in the, in the, the Bible when they say God, it's not, uh, they say him or he referring to God. It's lowercase. It bothers me. I'm like, how in the world do these people write this name and not know it's him? It's him. It's he. You know, like the one, capital O. And so, in fact, let me just push it. Let me see how sanctified y'all are. When you write about his joy, is it a capital J or a lowercase j? You're like, Brother Scott, that's getting a little touchy right there. I can't be writing every letter. <laughs> But the thing is, is that how much do you reference him? And listen, you're not a bad person if you, if you write those things in lowercase. Now, don't we write lowercase g on a God. We're going to have to have a Bible study, okay? But, but there's other things. If you write lowercase letters, the Lord's not concerned with what your actions. He's always looking at your heart. But I want you to know there's something special in a name. When you say Scott, you don't pronounce it. We talked about that already, Right? Put my O back in your mouth, all right? Scott, it's Scott, S-C-O-T-T. -T. You know, the next few words when you say your name, when you say my name, the next few words you're about to say has to deal with your understanding of who I am or my understanding of who you are. Think about the things that uh, you and I have talked about. All those things come to the center of what your understanding is. And so the questions you've asked me, are they not synonymous uh, when you say, Scott, have you da 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 how you ask me or what you ask me pertains to three major things concerning my life. And that is my character, that is my reputation, and that is my authority or my influence. And so when you use someone's name, I want you to understand is that you are calling those things into question at the moment. What are those things in regards to this person? When I married Julie and I said, I do, and Pastor Bert married us, I said, I do. When I said, I do, I was, I was thinking of Julie, in terms of who she's saying uh, yes to, she, I said, w w will you marry Scott Brandon? And when she said yes, she was saying yes to his character, which wasn't much, and his reputation, which that was not that much, and his authority, which was zero. You know, so, uh, so, so really, you know, I, I, I'm the one that benefited. She, she's still having to pay for that. My mom, when my mom called my name, she said, Scott Matthew Brandon? And when she said that, don't you know, she summoned all of my reputation, all of my character, and whatever influence I had on somebody else that caused them to do wrong, it was summoned before the judge that minute. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? You had to show up for an account. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. And I don't know what she's about to say, but I knew that all of my being was being accounted for in that moment. So when we take God's name, we use God's name. Are we using it in the same understanding? Um, because that's a big thing. When you talk about his authority, and you talk about his, his reputation and his character, those are humongous things. If you take those three things away, who are we serving? Uh, uh, not, nobody. Just figments of our imagination. What makes God who he is is the fact that he has an incredible reputation, power beyond limits, and character that no man can comprehend. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, I ask God as we get into your word and you begin to, to unfold truths in our life, Lord, I pray. Most likely, God, I know that as I studied, there were some things in my life that were hidden I didn't even know. And, and Father, I hate that I would live a life, God, that was not honoring you, respecting you, because I was ignorant to the standard you put in my life. And so I pray today, would you shine down upon us, Holy Spirit, illuminate our life, that every aspect of our life would glorify God. And we would not remain worshiping and loving a God with blind spots. But Lord, show us your word. Show us your desire. Show us who you are. 
and how we seek no longer to minimize those things because of ignorance uh, or even intention. We love it, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So what's in the name? Turn with me to Isaiah 45, 7. We see that there are a few things we can pull out really fast in terms of who God is and his name. He says, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. What is he saying right here? I am the Lord. His title is what? He's creator. We see what's in the name. Look at Numbers 15, 41. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Here again, I am the Lord who do what? Who did what? I brought you out. I delivered you. So he's our deliverer as well. Isaiah 43, 15 says, I am the Lord your holy one and the creator of Israel, your king. He's our holy one and our king and our creator. Malachi 3, 6 says this, for I the Lord do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. So who is the Lord? He is the unchanging one. There's a lot in a name. When we say Lord, we're not just calling upon a title, but there is a lot in that name. Now imagine this. Imagine if I said um, Brad Worley and Ethan Case are the most serious people I know in the world. If you don't know them, you would realize, mm, I don't know if you know them, Pastor Scott, because uh, they tend to joke around a little bit. Maybe you don't know them. Maybe you should get to know them. They may highlight your day. What if I said Claude Smith, Claude Smith is the epitome of selfishness? What if I said that Will Youngblood is the most effeminate man in the room? <laughs> what if I told you Pastor Randy is power hungry? Huh? Oh, he's, he's narcissistic. He don't care about nobody. It's just Pastor Randy. He's taking over the world. And what if I told you that Pastor Scott is the shortest winded preacher in Harrison, Arkansas? <laughs> you, you may not agree with those statements. And the reason why you may not agree with those statements is because you called into question immediately their character, their reputation, their influence. You see, there's a lot in a name, a lot in a name. So in dealing with God's name, is there ever a time that we're not calling into question those things? And I would submit to you today that, that, that Scott Brandon has many times, while loving and living for God the best I can, that I have used God's name in vain in different ways. And so sometimes I've done it in ignorance, not realize, realizing it, and sometimes I've done it with intention. So what does it mean to take his name in vain? Because for some of you, you'll say, I, I, I don't take his name in vain. I, I never put that God name in my mouth unless I'm worshiping, praising him. Well, let's talk about that as well. I would suggest that when we, well, here's the whole point, is why is this important? I would suggest that as we'll see, taking his name is this. It's stripping him of the things he desires for us to not only know about him, but to cherish. Taking God's name in vain strips him of those characters he desires us to both know and cherish. That's why taking his name is important. Because again, it's all about us understanding who God is and what he has to offer. And when we take his name, what we do is we strip him of those characteristics. We, we minimize those things that he wants us to know because they are for us. His love, his mercy, his grace, his goodness, those things are for us. His forgiveness, it's for us. And he doesn't want us to minimize those things by minimizing him. So when we say we take his name in vain, here's what you, you should know. This is the very act of choosing to use his name, which implicates his titles, his attributes, to be used in a way that does not bring him glory or edify ourselves for others or others. I was talking to a guy uh, today and he said, Pastor Scott, he goes, I, I didn't realize that I was taking his name in vain. I was using his name as a way to gain credibility with somebody else uh, and, and not really for his glory. And then I realized, oh man, that, that's not how you're supposed to use God's name. I was trying to use it to, to, to really establish myself or, or, or my desire or my will or my, or my want. And even though I wasn't speaking against his name, I wasn't using his name for what it was supposed to be used for. And that was to glorify him or to build each other up. And so let me tell you, when you say simple things uh, like this, you ever hear somebody say, oh my God. 
Did, did y'all feel that little sensitivity right there when I said that? When somebody says, Jesus Christ, it, it hits you, don't it? Now, before you stone me, I'm going to remind you that Isaiah was naked for two years to remind people of the things that were not right. So, unless you guys, okay, I'm going to move on from there, but, you know, I don't want to continue on that illustration. But you, you feel how that feels, right? Like, oh, don't, don't, don't do that. In fact, when I hear that name, when I hear Jesus, I mean, I, already I'm like, oh, please don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And you may say, Pastor Scott, this feels very legalistic to me. You're wrapping me all up, and, 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 and my faith is just being relegated to, to speech. Well, come on with me. Let's take a journey for it just a second. James chapter 3, verse 3 through 12. That's New Testament, by the way. James chapter 3, verse 3 through 12. Nobody wants to read this scripture. We all pass this as fast as we can. It says this, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a force is set such a blaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set uh, the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of our life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. What you have to understand is James is not concerned with your words at this moment. He understands the taming of the tongue is not possible. He's not even worried trying to to correct your behavior, that's not the issue. He's after something greater. He's after what is producing the words in your mouth. That's what he's concerned with. He understands that trees, can, trees cannot produce different types of fruit. He understands that. They produce what they are. Look at how Jesus puts it. Matthew 12, 33 through 37. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and it's fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. Let me back that up and say it again. I know you know it. For, the, for, the, uh, for out of the abundance of the heart, the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word that they speak. Every careless word, you mean every word we said we didn't mean? Every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Man, Lord, why you got to say it so much like that? that that's, that's when you close your Bible and say, amen, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. And just go on your way. Because we realize that when it comes to the word, we, we lack. And this is one of these scriptures that we realize we lack. The heart of this message is Jesus, he knows, he knows that in regards to taking his name in vain, that our hearts are saying two things. See, either we don't love God and therefore we curse him, or we don't think much of his holiness when we take his name in vain. And so let me talk about that. The very first thing is his holiness. Taking his name in vain makes him common to us. When we take his name in vain, it makes him common to us. His name declares his holiness to us. God, God's name is holy. It's holy. Holiness and sanctification were thing, are major things, actually, in the tabernacle. When God would, would, would go and he would have certain bowls or utensils or whatever those things that they would use in the temple, he would not allow anybody else to use those things. Look at Exodus 30, 29. He says, you shall consecrate them that they may be most holy, and whoever touches them will become holy. In other words, those things are set apart 
unto God only. In other words, if you're having an extra uh, dinner guest at your house, you can't take the bowl from the temple with you at home and use it like a common dish because that thing only has one purpose. It only has one purpose. And if you don't use things for its intended purpose, it gets kind of weird, you know, like, like you, don't, you don't realize this, but I want you to understand is that there are some things that we have in our life that are very sanctified. We don't use them for any other thing. Can y'all name one? You use it for one. Sorry, babe, I got your toothbrush this morning. So you, you, you use it for one thing. And, you know, it's important to use this toothbrush because if you don't use it rightly, you know, it, the toothbrush, what's it do? It, it fights disease, right? It's important that you use it for the proper intention because if you use it some other way that it wasn't designed to be used, you kind of take that thing like it's common. And, and I don't know about you, but I've heard some people this morning, they use God's name like they can just use it anywhere they want to. And I would tell you is that when you start to use God's name in places you, oh boy, I missed that this morning. Didn't I? When you miss, when you use his name for other, hold on a second. I was in the dirt yesterday. We was working outside and, oh, all right, good enough. So when you use his name in ways it's not supposed to be used, you, you kind of take the holiness away from that, right? <laughs> it's no longer sanctified. In fact, some of y'all are saying, Pastor Scott, why would you do that? Why would you, you just, you just scrubbed your toenail on live stream internet and in front of all of us. We had to look at your foot, Pastor Scott. We did not come here for a foot show. But what I want you to know is that it's not entirely horrible until Julie goes back home and she uses this toothbrush. <laughs> what do you mean I took his name in vain? What do you mean I took what was holy and set apart for one thing only and I used it in other ways? What do you mean I took away from his holiness? Well, in vain means to take worthlessly. You treat it like it has no worth, no value. In other words, you, you took what was holy and set apart and you made it common. And we do this in his name. And then we expect to go and pray and say, God, heal. God, deliver. God, do these. And we, all the whole time, we just, we just brush it. We just brush it. Lord, I want you to heal. Lord, I want you to save. And the Lord's like, do you think that I'm going to come down with this instrument that is unholy? Just because you call my name holy doesn't mean it's holy in your mouth. When you, when you took it out of its proper place and used it to express your unbelief, oh my God. Or when you said it in such a way that you didn't even believe, you, you, you said it ignorantly. You intended it to be some of the vile thing. You didn't bring me glory with my name. And you expect me to come down here and heal you? I'm not brushing my teeth with your praise. No. You see, it takes away from his authority. Taking his name in vain denies us of his authority because we can't use it to say one thing and then, then do another. And all authority comes from God. Romans 13, 1 says this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. To use his name is to invoke his authority. When I say, when I pray, I'm, well, God, I was just praying for, for Rick. And when I was praying for him, I said, in Jesus' name. That meant everything I said, I come under the power of Jesus Christ. If Rick needed to be saved again, we would have got saved. If he needed to be healed, 
he'd have been made whole. If he needed to be redeemed, he'd have been redeemed. Because all of that is bundled in the name of Jesus. There's no other name. I can't call on Buddha, Vishnu, or Allah. None of those names mean anything. But when I say Jesus, that's why when you hear the name Jesus on TV, you go, hmm. That's why when, when the world hears the name Jesus, they go, hmm. Because they don't care about any other name. But when you say the name of Jesus, it offends them. You know why? Because they remind, it reminds them, oh, I'm subject to that name. That's the name that created everything. That's the name that has authority over me. That's why I don't want you saying that name. You can say, you can say God loves you on a sign, and you may not get honked at, but you say Jesus loves you, and you start getting, uh, you know, those pretty fingers at you, and they say real encouraging words at you. Because I'm telling you, there's something about that name. We move on here. Matthew 5, 34 talks about when we take names in oath. He says, let your yes be yes and your no be no's. Matthew 5, 34 says, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven for it is the throne of God. When we use God's name, especially when it's, I promise to God, I will never do that again. Don't do that. Don't do that. If you, if you did it before, you didn't know, don't do it again. Because when you promise to God, you put yourself in a place where now God is subject to hold you accountable to the vow that you made. And here's the great thing about God, is that when you call him into a covenant, when you call him to a promise, he is now bound by himself to himself to uphold the things that you asked to do. And so if you just jump out because you thought it was a contract, not a covenant, when you just jump out because it didn't fit your bill anymore, just because you jump out of a marriage because it didn't feel your desires anymore, does not mean you can be released from that. Does not mean God can be released from the penalty of that, that divorce. Now, I don't mean to get into all that today. That's a whole other subject we'll talk about. But what I'm saying is, is that you can't just jump in and out of covenants because you want to. Because when you make an oath and God is involved in it, you have called his power. You have called his authority. You have called his character to make sure that what you have asked him to do, that he will do. And so we can't just minimize his name. Can I tell you that how serious you take his name is how serious you take his character. How serious you take his name is how serious you take his character. And how serious you take his character determines the amount of faith you have in him to actually do what you're asking him to do. That's big. That's humongous to me. Because I'm not just asking God to do this little frivolous prayer. When I ask God to do things for me, I need him to be everything his word says to be. I only go to God because he's capable of doing it. So I need his character and his name to fulfill it. When we make promises, we use his name in an empty way or through unbelief, we minimize that. And all this leads up to his reputation, what he's known for. When we, when we use his name in vain or take his name in vain, it belittles his acts toward us. And I don't know about you, but I don't need any of God's acts to be belittled. I need everything that God has done to be great for me because when I have another issue in my life or another problem in my life or another addiction I run into or another sin I go through or another family member who tries to t test me or challenge me, I need the same God who was here to be the same God who was back there. I don't need a powerful God back here and a weak God right here. I need him to be the same. I need his reputation to be the same God. We just, we just sang that song just a second ago. And so here we have to watch what we do. Look at Ezekiel 20, verse 8 through 10. This is what I love about God, that what he does is bound to himself. Even when we're totally in the wrong, he's still faithful to us. Ezekiel 20, verse 8 through 10 says this, But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. None of them cast away the detestable things their eyes feasted on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said I would pour out my wrath upon them and spend my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But, notice that, let me back up just a second and just read that real fast. 
Then I said I would pour out my wrath upon them and spend my anger against them in the, in the midst of the land of Egypt. Why? Because they were doing detestable things. We talked about that last, uh, last few weeks. But I acted for the sake of my name that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they live. Who is that? The lost Gentile world. Those who don't love God. Those who don't care for God. He said, my name is important even unto them. Even unto them. I, 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 it matters to me. And whose sight I, might, I made myself known to them and bringing them out of the land of Egypt. So I led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I, I, this was, when I read this, I thought, you know what? When God could find no basis in them, in Israel, for extending his mercy and his grace, he did it solely for his namesake. Solely for his namesake. For his own glory. When he found in us no reason to forgive us, no reason to give us grace, no reason to give you merit for anything at all, he did it because of his name sake. I love that because when our actions do not merit his mercy and his grace, God acts on the basis of his name. Do you know what kind of burden that unpacks in my spirit when I go to God and I'm not worth his, his forgiveness? I'm not worth his love. I'm not worth his grace. I know that he's those things to me because of his name's sake. Because his name's sake. Because he says, Scott, I'm so concerned with the people looking at your life that I will do for you what you don't deserve so that those who look at you might know how faithful I am. Mm. So go back to your job. Go back to your world. Go back to your cancer. Go back to those things that would cause us to suffer and pray, God, bring an audience to my life. Bring an audience to my life. Because when you do this, I need you to get every bit of the glory that comes out of it. I don't mind suffering. I don't mind going through it. But don't let it be in vain. Don't let your name and the glory of your name be in vain. Act, O oh God, on the holiness and the glory of your name. For his name speaks of his faithfulness to others through us. His faithfulness speaks of the glory found in his name. But we often profane his name. We mix it like this toothbrush. You know, you know the great thing about this toothbrush is that we'll go buy another one, <laughs> you know? It's real easy. Well, I misused it. I'll just throw that away. You won't use that no more. But how do you do that with the reputation of God? How do you just go buy another one? How do you do that with yourself? You can't. And so here we see that God's reputation is paramount to us. It's huge to us. We cannot profane it by making something that is priceless to become worthless. For us to take his name in vain is to make little of his past actions. Can I tell you the time he forgave you or answered your prayers when you don't deserve it or the time he saved your life when he called you on his name, the time he hung on a cross for your sins, we cannot belittle those things. And when we take God's name in vain, we're making those actions to be nothing, to be little. You see, his, using his name belittles our own salvation. That he's not a great God now. So what makes him a great God back then? It strips him of it. And so I'm here, my heart, my heart today is simply this, is that we walk and we act in such a way to know that God desires us to know what healing is. He desires to, to, for us to know what authority is. He desires for us to know what redemption is, what salvation is, what hope that comes to fruition actually is. He wants us to see the hand. We got to honor his heart. We got to honor his name. 
That's why this third commandment is so important. Because we, when we don't honor his name, we rob our very selves. We take from ourselves. And before we say, Pastor Scott, that's not really, I don't really struggle with those. I don't really struggle. I don't say those words. They don't come out of my mouth. I, I, I really feel like I'm walking clean. Praise God. I'm glad that you are. Can I just raise the standard for you today? I'm going to read you some scripture that uh, I don't like this. Of all the scripture in the word, I don't like this one the most. Because it never lets me walk away innocent. Ever. Join me in Romans chapter 1, verse 32. Paul is talking, and he's speaking about this humongous list of things that those who don't walk in the light and those who walk against the power and the name and the glory of God, what they do. And it's this humongous list. You can go back and read it. And then he comes to verse 32, just in case you're a Pharisee like I am and we skip all those other issues. He says, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. They give approval to those who practice them. When I looked that word up, give approval, what does that mean? What is, what is Paul saying? He's saying, you may not do those things, but you're giving approval to those things. And we find the word approval or give approval, it's one word in the Greek, means to give consent. It means to allow the action to continue in one's presence without intervention. It means to give permission with one's presence. Turn with me to Acts chapter 22, verse 20. This is Paul speaking here. And he's talking about himself at the stoning of Stephen. And he says this, And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. Same word in the Greek, give approval to those who practice those things. It's the same word right here in Acts 22, 20. Approving and watching. Approving and watching. Paul says, I could, I could have stopped it, but I stood there approving of it by allowing myself to observe it. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? I'm not asking if you say those things. I'm asking, are you approving of those things? I'm asking, what are you watching? I'm asking, what are you listening to? I've come to raise a standard in your life and my life as well. I, 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 there's movies I have grown up loving, and, and I can't watch them anymore. Because the first thing they say robs me of his authority and his power. The first thing they say robs me of a God, I need to forgive me. And so what, I'm, what, I'm, what I want you to understand is that it's not just okay that we don't practice those things. We can't give approval to those things by our consent, by standing by and watching them like Paul did. And even though he had something he could do to stop it, he did not. And if you and I are watching and listening to things, knowing that they're wrong, our very not stopping of those things is approval to those things. And Paul says in Romans 132, you're guilty, just as guilty as those who do those things. That's a heavy, that's a heavy thing. It's a heavy thing. But you have to know the heart of God as the worship team comes up. But you have to know the heart of God is that his desire is to not beat you with the tablets of the law, his desire is that when you call upon him for healing, when you call upon him for salvation, when you call upon him for redemption, when you call upon him for forgiveness, that God that you call upon is every bit as powerful as the word says he is. And he does not want us by any means to diminish everything he wants to be to us. Do you hear what he's saying? What he's saying, don't take my name. Don't take my name. He's not saying, don't take my name, as if he's got to defend himself. He doesn't have to defend himself with us. He is saying, children, sons, daughters, 
Don't take out of the hand of your father. He longs to bless you with this hand. So don't rob me by the very thing that allows me to grant those things to you. So this morning, how do we respond? What do we say? We'll respond the way I responded. First off, I just said, Lord, thank you for letting me know this. It's nothing worse than you doing wrong things to people and you don't realize that you're doing wrong. It's like when you call somebody's name out and it's the wrong name, you feel horrible. <laughs> and they're just like, that's not my name, that's not my name, you know. You feel bad. I, I've done it a few times. So when you realize what the truth is, you're so grateful. Because now you can walk in obedience and honoring God. So we're going to thank him first off. Second thing is we're going to say, Lord, forgive me. Search me. Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't really mean those things. I didn't know those things. But now I know. And so I'm asking for forgiveness for the times I took your name in vain. I didn't even realize it. Or maybe I did. Maybe I did know. And I just didn't think about it. I, I, didn't, I didn't revere your name enough. But now I understand it's heavy on me, God. And so I want to ask for forgiveness. And the third thing is we're going to do is we're going to worship. We're going to worship God. Because worshiping God brings back the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that says, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You know, can I, can I just say something? Last week I said something that, boy, got me quick. And the Lord just tapped me on my shoulder and said, uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not what we do. That's not what we do. And so I, I got to make a public apology because I said something last week that I just, it been, it's been on my heart all week long. And so I, I said, well, if you were here, you probably knew what I said because the crowd said, whoa. And I want to say I'm sorry that I didn't respect this office. I didn't respect who I was representing, that I just let careless words come out of my mouth. And so I asked God, God, forgive me. And honor, I didn't honor your word and honor your people, and honor your place, your presence. And so I, I ask you this morning for forgiveness as well. And so this morning, if you'll stand with me, here's how we're going to respond. We're going to respond in this way. We're going to worship. They're going to lead us in some songs, and I'm going to lead us in prayer first. And here's what it's okay to do. It's okay to do this. Some of you might want to come down here and pour your heart out to God at these altars. That's fine. That's expected you want to do that, you can. If you want to stand right there and just pour your heart out to God and, 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 and ask Him for your forgiveness, thank Him for His goodness and revealing these things in your heart and life, then you can do that as well. But listen, make sure you worship. That we need a sensitivity that we're not carelessly using His name in vain and then we're frustrated that when we call on His name why He doesn't answer would you pray with me, Father in heaven? So many times, God. So many times, God, I just, I just said you, I just threw it out there as if you were a deaf God, as if you were a God who wasn't close to me, as if you were a God who had forsaken me and didn't hear my words. Oh God, you hear my every word and my every pain and my every moment of frustration. God, you hear my every word. You are a God who is near. I pray, God, today you forgive me, forgive us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing your word to, to cut away the issues of our life, God, to cut away, God, the excess in our life that's not healthy to us. These things may not be damning, God. It may not be something that causes us to go to hell. But God, I know one thing. They sure don't help us understand you. They sure don't help us to know you. So God, would you take our hearts, those who have spoken, God, with ill intent, and those of us, God, who have spoken ignorantly and not treated the name of God as a holy thing. Forgive us, God. Forgive us. We want to be a church that when we pray, you answer. We want to be a church that when we pray, you answer. And God, how can we be a church that you answer when we use your name outside of its intended 
purpose. And so, Father, forgive us. And as we worship, Lord, I pray, as we worship, I ask, oh, humbly God, that you would sensitize our hearts again, that you would call back into our lives the sensitivity of knowing your voice, hearing the Holy Spirit say, "Uh uh-uh, don't do that. Oh, I pray, God, make us sensitive once again to your name. In Jesus' name we pray.